Okay, let's get started. Turn this off. So, I see fewer people today. <laughs> I guess it's the holiday plus the beautiful weather after six months. Well, you're dedicated, so you'll, you'll learn the fun stuff. <laughs> of course, you could have watched my videos from last year too, but you decided to be here. That's good. Okay, uh, so we're going to talk about SIMD processors, another execution paradigm that's, that's been extremely powerful, and especially powerful today with the advent of GPUs. Uh, it was not as powerful before. It was restricted to supercomputers, but now almost everyone has a supercomputer in their pocket. Right? The GPU is essentially a SIMD processor that's, that has made its way to everywhere in the world almost. Uh, before I go, I'll just uh, make an announcement. I told several people who were interested, but I'm starting a seminar course, bachelor seminar course in computer architecture starting next fall. Uh, it's two credit units. It's a rigorous seminar on fundamental and cutting edge research topics in computer architecture. Not only research, it's also design topics. But basically it's a seminar course, so it's, it involves critical presentation, review and discussion of seminal works in computer architecture. And we will cover many ideas and issues do a lot of critical thinking, critical analysis, uh, analyze the trade-offs of the ideas and the issues, and perform brainstorming as well. So it should be fun if you do well in this course. I'll put that if over there. I think it's a good, <laughs> good predication, uh, for a predicate to be satisfied for you to take that course. And uh, it'll, it'll involve a lot of participation in the discussion, uh, presentation, there will be at least one presentation. You'll see the format later on. We can discuss it more. And report and review writing as well. So stay tuned for more information. It's not on the, I think it'll be on EDOS soon uh, so that you can see uh, that it, uh, it, it's, you can register for it. But if, you're, if you have questions, please let me know. It'll be a fun course. It'll be a limited uh, number of slots. It's not going to be 400 students like this. So hopefully those interested can attend. Okay, so for the curious, uh, I've given you a bunch of row hammer attacks recently, but there was a, another row hammer attack that was recently introduced or recently exposed. This was yesterday. Uh, and Kabe may be somewhere over here. Yeah, he's sitting over there. He's one of those, this guy over here, <laughs> who has, who's responsible for doing all of this row hammer attacks. But it's good, I think. Uh, this is actually an interesting one where you can do remote memory accesses and through the remote memory accesses, RDMA, remote uh, direct memory accesses, you can actually induce bit flips on a remote machine. If you're interested, you can read that paper over there. And he was actually author on the other paper that I mentioned last time, right? By uh, using the GPU, integrated GPU in a mobile system and exploiting the WebGL interface, you can actually uh, in, uh, escalate your privilege. I believe there's more to come. Uh, and I think that it's really interesting to look at. So some of the papers that we may look at in the seminar course are going to be related to hardware security issues that are going to be forward-looking. So a part of the seminar will be forward-looking because it's really important to be forward-looking in security, in hardware, in architecture. And that's going to, uh, it's, it's important to know the background as well as the skills to, be, to figure out how to be forward-looking. Okay, so this is where we are. That's just uh, um, uh, a seminar course that, that could be useful for you. We'll talk more about that later on. And if you have questions, please let me know. Please let Juan know also, he'll, he'll be involved in that course as well. So remember, you covered everything and we were covering auto, uh, other execution paradigms. Today we're going to talk about SIMD and these are the readings for today. I would strongly recommend that you do these readings. Uh, they're relatively light readings, uh, in my opinion, uh, but I'll cover uh, both of them in some detail. But some of the things that we we're going to cover is actually not covered uh, in any of the textbooks. The section seven, uh, chapter seven of, uh, which book is this? Uh, Harris and Harris. Uh, that actually covers some vector SIMD processing, but very, very little. It doesn't do justice to SIMD processing as it is available in the field today. Because SIMD processing is something that, uh, that needs to be taught in such a course like this, but not many, paper, not many uh, books actually do justice to it. That's why we're covering it uh, this way. Okay, so this is where we were, if you remember. We've covered all these execution paradigms. We talked about branch prediction and how important it is to many of these execution paradigms. Today, we're going to go over here and we'll see how branches are handled in this paradigm also. It's interesting. Uh, 
And uh, SIMD processing is essentially used in vector and array processors. I'm going to introduce the terminology. These are actually duals, time and space duals of each other. And GPUs take advantage of SIMD processing, plus fine-grained multi-threading, uh, and of course, pipelining. Uh, all of these take advantage of pipelining over here to actually improve performance. GPUs are essentially a combination of vector and array processing plus fine-grained multi-threading. So what is SIMD processing? SIMD means single instruction, multiple data. Basically, it exploits regular data parallelism. If you remember data flow, data flow is very good at exploiting irregular data parallelism. If your data parallelism is irregular, data flow is great because an instruction starts firing after the data values, data operands are available. And you don't know when the data is going to be available. Here, the parallelism is going to be very regular. A single instruction will operate on many, many data elements. Think about a vector. If you're doing, uh, if you're adding two vectors element-wise, and if the two vectors are each one million elements long, you have a lot of data parallelism. You can say one add, and that add can specify one million operations. You don't need to say add, 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 add for each element. You just say add, and that add operates on one million elements, pair of elements at the same time. That's the idea over here. It's very powerful. So this is actually uh, first one of, one of the places where it was first introduced was in this Mike Flynn's seminal paper, which really introduced a taxonomy of computers. And the idea over here is to look at computers in two dimensions. You have instructions and data uh, in two different dimensions. And the key question is, are you executing a single instruction at a time or multiple instructions? And what is that single instruction or multiple instructions operating on? A single data element or multiple data elements? So because you have two things over here, single instruction versus multiple instructions, and single instruction versus multiple, a single data versus multiple data elements, you have four different options. One is single instruction, single data processor. In this case, single instruction operates on a single data element. Well, data elements, it could be actually two operands, but it's essentially single operation on uh, a single data element. You just add those data elements, right, two of those. So this is what we've seen earlier, essentially. Uh, that's uh, the, this, uh, the sequential execution model that we've seen is essentially single instruction, single data. Uh, and we've developed many techniques to improve that. SIMD, on the other hand, you have a single instruction that can operate on multiple data elements. You can think of the first one as a scalar also. Essentially, single instruction operates on a single element. That's a scalar value. Whereas single instruction operates on multiple data elements in SIMD, you operate on vectors. When you have a single instruction, you don't operate on single elements. You, you operate on, let's say, 4,000 elements. Who specifies that 4,000? We will see. It's the length of the vector. So array processors and vector processors are examples of this. There are others we will see later on. MISD is kind of an interesting one. Multiple instructions operating on a single data element. Basically, you're feeding a single data element, and it gets operated on by multiple instructions. Maybe first instruction trans transforms it to something. The next instruction transforms it to something else, something else, and those instructions are supplied at once. And we will see examples of this, actually. The closest form of this is really a systolic array processor. We may not understand this right now, but systolic arrays uh, were developed as uh, early as 1970s, and uh, they were used, they're, they're being used right now, uh, again, for machine learning acceleration. And we will see why, why this makes sense. Uh, some of these are also called streaming processors, and these will be, this will be important when we get to it. And the last part of the taxonomy is multiple instructions operating on multiple data elements. We've seen an example of this also, multi-threaded processors. Essentially, now you have multiple instruction streams. Multiple different instruction streams, they're all operating on different data elements. Uh, as a result, you have essentially a multiprocessor or multi-threaded processor. So this is the taxonomy. And we've already seen uh, the SISD part and the MIMD part. Uh, now we're going to look at the SIMD part. In a later lecture, we're going to look at MISD, if you will. OK, let's do the SIMD part. So basically, we're going to talk about data parallelism. What is data parallelism? It means that data, uh, let me do this over here. OK, that's better. Concurrency uh, parallelism arises from performing the same operation on different pieces of the data. Same operation, same add or same multiply, or same divide, or same increment, same load. So you, when you do a load, you load 10,000 elements at the same time. Well, at the same time, we'll see that. Uh, what does that mean exactly? Uh, for example, if you do dot product of two vectors, or if you do element-wise increment of a single vector. Let's be simple, right? 
That's essentially a worked vector operation. You do the same thing on multiple data. So contrast this with data flow, and data flow concurrency arises from executing different operations in parallel in a data-driven manner. There's no irregularity in data flow, right? You look at the data flow graph, it could be completely irregular. Okay? And contrast this with th thread or control parallelism. If you have multiple threads, concurrency arises from executing different threads of control in parallel. And these threads could be doing completely different things. They could be doing the same thing, but they could be doing completely different things also. And a fine-grained multi-threaded machine exploits that parallelism to, max, uh, to improve throughput right, of, the, of, the, of the processor. SIMD, on the other hand, exploits operation-level parallelism on different data elements. So you have the same operation concurrently applied to different pieces of data. It's really a, a form of instruction-level parallelism. Now, I, I'm throwing terms at you, but instruction-level parallelism is uh, getting parallelism out of multiple instructions or the same instruction uh, uh, such that you do some things concurrently, right? In this case, the instruction happens to be the same across many different pieces of the data, right? Instruction and operation are the same in this case, but instruction is the same. Okay, we'll see examples of this. I already said this. This could happen in time or in space. So there's this time-space duality, like in many, many other things in the world. Uh, you, can, you need to have multiple processing elements to be able to exploit this. You cannot exploit parallelism without multiple processing elements. Hopefully that's clear uh, at this point. You have to have, have multiple resources, if you will. And the time-space duality distinguishes what I mentioned earlier, whether you have an array processor or a vector processor. And this will be very clear soon. In an array processor, an instruction operates on multiple data elements at the same time using different spaces. Different spaces meaning different functional units. So if you do an add, you have four different add functional units, and an add operates on four different data elements at the same time, four different pairs of data elements. Okay. Vector processor, on the other hand, is the time dual of this array processor. In this case, the instruction operates on multiple data elements in consecutive time steps using the same space using the same functional unit. So this is a purest distinction. There are two, uh, 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 in, the, in one extreme, there's the array processor. In, one ex in the other extreme, there's the vector processor. But modern GPUs are actually a combination of these. But we will see these as separate for now. Now, let me demonstrate this pictorially. Uh, let's take a look at a program. And bear with me. This is essentially uh, what we're doing right now is a load instruction loading four different elements from array A into a vector register that happens to be able to house four different elements. So we're not scalar anymore. We're not loading a single value, element, uh, the first element A. We're loading four different elements of A and putting them into a vector register specified in the ISA, and that can house four elements at the same time. That's the concept, basically. In this case, I picked four. That's our vector length in this case, but it could be anything. As we will see later on, we're going to look at vector length of 64. So what does this program do? You're loading four different elements of the array, putting them into a vector register. And this add is essentially a vector add. It's incrementing each element by one. That's what this specifies. And putting the result into the same vector register. Oh, I shouldn't do that. And then this multiply is multiplying this, uh, the, the results by two. What you're doing is you're taking each element of A, incrementing it by one, multiplying the result by two, and then storing it into A again. And all of this is happening in parallel. And these, uh, you, you, now we are ex exploiting data level parallelism because we have to do this operation on four elements of this vector. So how can you design a processor that exploits this? Array processor essentially does each operation at the same time at different spaces. So this load instruction, you have four processing elements that can do loads, and you do all loads at the same time. Okay, let's assume that it takes one cycle here. Now you have the results in the vector register at, at, at the end of the cycle. Now you can do all adds at the same time, right? Now you have the results in the vector register in the, at the end of the cycle. Now you can do all multiplies at the same time. It's the same instruction uh, executed on different data elements. And now you have the results. You can do all the stores at the same time. As you, uh, as you can see, this is four cycles, assuming your, each of your elements takes four cycles. We're going to be more realistic later. Vector processor, on the other hand, is very different. 
as you can see over here, each, now if you look over here, each processing element is able to do everything. If you load, add, multiply, store, such that you can do multiple of these at the same time. Here, we have customized processing elements, load, add, multiply, store, and we can only do start one operation of an element in a cycle. So if you look at this, uh, in the first cycle, we start the load of the first element. In the next cycle, we start the load of the same element, uh, second element in the load unit. Now we can do start the add of the first element of the second instruction. In the third cycle, we start the load of the third element, element two, while we're starting the add of the element one, and while we're doing uh, the multiple, when we, uh, while we're starting the multiply of element zero. Now in the next cycle, we start the load of the third element, and add of the second, multiply of the first, and store of the zero, if you will. So if you look over here, what has happened is, with one instruction, we specified four load operations, four different uh, loads of different elements, but we're doing them in consecutive cycles. We're not doing them in the same cycle. That's the time-space duality. And if you keep doing this, that's what happens to the pipeline. And if you look at these two processors, in the array processor, you're doing the same operation at the same time. In the vector processor, you're doing the different operations at the same time. That's how you're exploiting the parallelism. And if you look at space, meaning processing elements, in the same space, you have to be able to do different operations, or you should provide space to be able to do different operations. In vector processor, you uh, you're, you're doing the same operation at the same space. Make sense? But of course, there's a trade-off. In the array processor, you're done earlier, assuming what I've assumed. In the vector processor, you're done a little bit later, as you can see. But there are trade-offs, clearly. Vector processor is probably cheaper, because you don't need to have four load units operating in parallel. Here, you, uh, you, can, you, you can get away with a single load unit. And that's true for a single add unit, single multiply unit. So that's the time-space duality. Later, we will merge these two, and that'll be, become a GPU. A GPU is able to do both array processing, multiple operations, the same operation on different elements at the same time, and also uh, over different cycles as well. Make sense? So hopefully the concept is clear. It's actually a beautiful, very simple concept. Now, if you can, now you can think of why graphics is a very good fit. Graphics, you have images, a lot of images. You're doing the same operation on many different parts of the image. It could be resizing the image, it could be zooming into parts, but it's essentially the same operation on millions of pixels. You can parallelize it this way. A single instruction operates on millions of pixels at the same time. And we will see examples of this. And these actually, these SIMD extensions, single instruction multiple data extensions, were introduced into the processors to be able to handle graphics, video, imaging workloads. And their, their, main play, uh, their mainstream in all processors that I know of, and GPUs are a, a specialized example of uh, processors that actually can do this really, really powerfully. Okay, let me contrast SIMD array processing with VLIW, because there is a, there's actually a really nice contrast. And historically, VLIW was developed uh, as an argument against SIMD, if you will, as an alternative against SIMD, I shouldn't say argument. And you will, see the, you will see how that's developed. So this was VLIW. If you remember VLIW, we had an instruction bundle. And a pro when you actually uh, fetch an instruction, you're really fetching multiple operations. But those multiple operations are completely independent or can be completely independent of each other. Right? They have to be actually completely independent of each other. But they can be different. This can be an add. This can be a load. This can be a move. This can be a multiply. Right? You're exploiting, again, instruction-level parallelism or operation-level parallelism, but compilers packing instructions such that they're independent, and that's how you're exploiting parallelism over here. If you look at SIMD array processing, this is what's happening. Basically, you're encoding an operation. It's a single operation is operating on multiple different data elements. It's a similar kind of parallelism, but it's very regular. Right? This operation gets expanded to uh, adds of different pairs of elements. Element zero, element one, element two, element three over here. Right. That's the idea over here. This is, a, this is a vector increment, if you will. You're incrementing by one. So that's the contrast. Here, you can do independent operations that, that are completely unrelated. Here, you can exploit parallelism, but the, inst uh, the instruction needs to operate on different data elements. Okay, 
And this is beautiful and simple because the compiler ensures these are independent. This is beautiful and simple because the data is all parallel. And you don't need to ensure independence. If you know that you're operating on different elements, then you don't need to even check whether they are independent, right? Okay, so let's go into a little bit more depth. Uh, that's the pictorial uh, view. And we will get back to this actually. So what is a vector? Hopefully everybody knows what a vector is, right? You've seen vectors. Have you programmed with vectors? I assume so, that's good. Have you programmed with SIMD instructions? GPUs? Some people. Okay, maybe we should do that. Okay, a vector is essentially a one-dimensional area of numbers, I mean, uh, in this case. Uh, many scientific commercial programs use vectors. This is an example that I'm going to use in this lecture. It's essentially doing an element-wise average of two vectors. There could be uses for this, but you could do any kind of operation, right? You could do dot product of two vectors, which is a little bit more complicated than this. Uh, and this is, as you can see, these are 50 element vectors over here. You're, uh, you're element-wise averaging 50, 250 element vectors, A, B, and putting the result into a vector C. This is the sequential SISD, single instruction, single data version of the code. Now we're going to see how inefficient this code is compared to SIMD. Okay, a vector processor is one whose instructions operate on vectors rather than scalar or single data values. That's the simple definition of a vector processor. So there are some basic requirements for vector. I'm going to, I'm going to use the name vector for a while because we're going to look at vectors. But a lot of the things I'm going to say will be applicable to array processors also. But we're going to see the specific example of vector processors because these were developed uh, such that you can make use of little hardware very, very efficiently. And vector processor is much less hardware than an array processor because you don't need to do multiple operations at the same time, multiple of the same operations at the same time, right? Okay, there are basic requirements. You need to load and store vectors from memory. So you need some vector registers that can contain vectors. We don't have scalar registers that contain a single 32-bit value, but we have vector registers that can contain, let's say, 64 32-bit values, zero, element zero uh, all the way to element 63. You need to be able to operate on vectors of different lengths. You need to tell that to hardware. So you need to, you need to have a vector length register that says, oh, at this point, you should be operating on a vector of length three. It could be 60, it could be 64. The maximum length is what's, uh, what's uh, what, uh, the maximum uh, vector length that's provided by the hardware. But you should be able to change that, right? Because you're not always operating on vectors that are of length 64. Sometimes you're operating on vectors that are length four, depending on what this I bound is checking, right? Okay. And also, uh, there, uh, you need to be able to lay out your vector in memory, and you need to be able to specify that. This is how you can exploit the parallelism inside the memory. Uh, basically, elements of a vector might be stored apart from each other in memory. They may not be always consecutive. So you need to have a, a register that specifies how far apart each element uh, of, uh, how far apart uh, are the consecutive elements of a vector inside the memory. Now, if the vector is uh, stored consecutively inside the memory, then that stride is one. We will get back to this in a little bit. Uh, but basically, uh, you, can, you can tell the hardware, uh, the, di the distance between the elements of a vector inside memory is, uh, specified by this vector stride. And I already uh, specified this over here. This is stride is the distance in memory between two elements of a vector. Actually, let me show you an example of this quickly, uh, now that we're on the topic. Too many chairs here that are getting in the way. See, a vector processor eliminates all of these dependencies. There's no, there's no use for these chairs in a vector processor. Okay, so are we gonna turn off the autofocus, I think, right? I remember, that's turned off now. Okay, so if you look memory, look at memory over here, uh, this is memory address zero, memory address n minus one. Uh, what might happen is uh, your vector zero could be here, your vector 500 long, let's say this is a 512 uh, element vector, and each element can be stored consecutively over here, right? So you have a 512 element vector. Now, if you want to access every single element of this vector, let's say you want to do a vector load uh, from this address, let's say A, uh, you set the stride, vector stride set to one. Or that's one, one possible encoding. We'll see better encoding over, uh, later. 
But if you want, if you don't, let's say you don't want to access every single element of this vector. Uh, you want to access every eighth element of a vector for whatever reason, right? You want to access element zero, element uh, eight, element 16, dot, dot, dot. You don't set the vector stride to one then, you set the vector stride to, uh, sorry, not 16, eight. Now what this says, tells the machine is, start from address A, the next element you're going to load is going to be, uh, the first element you're going to load is address A, uh, the, the element at address A. The next element you're going to load is address A, uh, is located as address A plus the sprite. The next element you're going to load is this one plus the sprite. So you keep adding the sprite, right? This way you can access every eighth element of the vector if you need to do so. There might be something in those eight elements, and we will see that in a little bit. So if you set the stride to one, you basically access elements located in these locations, right? If you do a vector load A, that's what you would load. Of course, I didn't show you the vector length over here. You need to set the vector length to how many elements you're going to load uh, into this register. So these vector length registers and vector stride registers are important. This tells you how many elements you're going to your vector instruction is going to operate on, and this vector stride tells you if it's a memory instruction, load or store, how are you going to compute the address of those elements? The next element's address is essentially computed by adding the previous element's address to the stride, which is provided to you, uh, to you by the program. So this vector stride enables you to arbitrarily locate different elements in memory, and we will see more of this. Okay, hopefully that's clear. So let's go back over here. Okay, so we already said this. A vector instruction performs an operation on each element in consecutive cycles because it's a vector processor. Uh, vector functional units are pipelined so that you can exploit that element level parallelism. Let's say you're operating on a million element vector. You can actually have a million deep pipeline, right? Now every pipeline stage can be operating on different elements. That's the beauty of vector processing, actually. Why can we do this? We can allow these deeper pipelines because we know that each element, uh, each operation is independent of the other one, right? That's the idea. There's no dependency within the vector. So there's no need to do dependency checking between these operations. All of that dependency checking logic goes away because you know that you're operating on different data elements and they have nothing to do with each other. There's no control flow within a vector. You're doing the same operation on a million elements. There's no need for control flow. In fact, there's no need for a branch. We're gonna see that we're gonna eliminate the branch in the program that I showed you earlier. Right. And the known stride, the fact that you know the stride because the layout of the data is nice, like we've seen earlier, that allows easy address calculation for all vector elements. Just, as, just like I showed you, right? You basically take the base address plus the stride compute the next address, and then you take the next address plus the stride, next address plus the stride, next address plus the stride, dot, dot, dot. As long as the elements are separated with a constant stride, you don't have a problem. That's beautiful, this can enable now actually more aggressive methods that we have not seen, but you can prefetch the vectors into the registers, cache, or memory before your program actually executes the uh, instruction. We're not gonna talk about prefetching. If you're interested in prefetching, you should take that seminar course and the master's course in computer architecture. Unfortunately, we don't have time. But this regular pattern enables the processor to predict what the address is going to be next, right? It's very easy to predict the address if the stride is constant. And I'll digress a little bit, but a lot of existing processors, actually all existing processors, high performance processors have these prefetchers that can try to, that try to predict what, are the, what is the access we're going to access next. If you have a stride, it's very easy. Okay, let's talk about the advances a little bit, and then we're going to go uh, into more detail of how this really works. As I said, there are no dependencies within a vector. This way you can do deep pipelining, parallelization, array processing is essentially parallelization of a vector, if you think about it in a different way. Uh, so you can have very deep pipelines, highly parallel machines. Each instruction generates a lot of work. The good thing is you don't need to, you just need to fetch the instruction once, and that instruction tells you to do a million things or the vector length number of things, 
This way, you don't need to fetch the same instruction over and over. We will see how many instructions we fetch in a single instruction, single data model, right? If you're actually uh, adding a million elements, let's say, of two different vectors element-wise, you need to fetch the same instruction a million times. It's so inefficient, right? One of the advantages of a GPU or a vector processor is essentially you fetch one instruction and that enables a lot of work. That's why these uh, processors are very power efficient, assuming you have this sort of parallelism. You have a highly regular memory access pattern and no need to explicitly code loops unless your vector length is actually larger than the vector length that's supported by your instruction set architecture. And we will see that. But this reduces the branches in the instruction sequence, as we will see in an example. Now, of course, with everything, there, there are many advantages, but there's also disadvantages. And uh, it's really important to understand these very well. The big disadvantage here is it works only if you have this regular parallelism, data parallelism, or SIMD type of parallelism, right? So plus plus is vector operations. If you're doing a lot of operations on vectors, arrays, images, matrices, that's great. But if your parallelism is irregular, these machines are very, very inefficient. GPUs are, for example, extremely inefficient if you want to uh, run a program where there are a lot of dependencies that are very, very irregular. Basically, if you're doing scalar operations all the time. Right? For example, searching for a key in a linked list. There are a lot of dependencies over there. Unless you're, unless you're doing this on many, many linked lists and everything is in parallel, this becomes very inefficient. And this is exactly why uh, VLIW, very long instruction word architectures, were developed. And I'm going to quote something from that beautiful paper by Josh Fisher in, in 1983, uh, when he actually introduced the concept of very long instruction word architectures, he took vector processors as an example. At that time, interestingly, image processing was not as big as today. So people actually, uh, vector machines were not as popular, if you will, were not as mainstream. Uh, so this is actually true for all vector machines today. There's nothing wrong here, but VLIW was able to be developed at that time because there, was a, uh, there, there were a lot of places where you had these irregular parallelism. That's still true, but maybe there's a lot of regular parallelism that people have exploited by unleash, unleashing the computing power that we have today. So basically, he says, to program a vector machine, the compiler or hand coder must make the data structures in the code fit nearly exactly the regular structure built into the hardware. What does this mean? Your vector length needs to fit, and your memory, access, memory layout needs to be nice. You need to be able to do these strided access patterns. If your program doesn't naturally have those, good luck. You need to be able to actually jump through hoops to be able to do that. That's exactly why port, not, uh, porting, uh, porting irregular programs to a GPU today is hard for the same reason. Now that's hard to do in the first place and just as hard to change. Just as hard to change means if, you, if, you, if, if your hardware changes a little bit, you need to actually change your program to, take, uh, to actually take, uh, get, the higher, uh, get the best parallels. One tweak to the hardware, and the low-level code has to be rewritten by a very smart and dedicated programmer who knows the hardware and often the subtleties of the application area. This actually is still relatively true. Uh, and that's the disadvantage of a vector, vector machine. If your parallelism is regular, you can exploit it well. If your parallelism is very irregular, you'll have to go through these pains. And maybe you're better off with a VLIW machine. OK, another limitation uh, of a vector process, and we, this will become clear soon, is Memory bandwidth, especially bandwidth, can easily become a bottleneck if your compute to memory operation balance is not maintained and if your data is not mapped appropriately to different memory banks. This will be very clear soon when we go through an example uh, program. And it'll be very clear, this is, this is the reason why people developed a lot of memory bandwidth enhancing techniques in the context of vector processors, because vector processors unleash so much parallelism. A vector load enables loading of a million elements. How do you get all those million elements quickly into the processing units? You're bottleneck by memory. OK, let's do a little bit more depth. So let's take a look at these vector data registers, for example. Each vector data register holds n m-bit values. In this case, m-bit is the width of the data register. Uh, as you can see there, I showed three registers over here. And n is the vector length, uh, the maximum vector length you can have in hardware. So there are vector control registers, as we said, vector length, vector stride. I'm going to introduce vector mask also. So maximum, maximum vector length can be n, as I said. That's the maximum number of elements stored in a vector register. So this vector, this is vector register 0. You have elements 0 through n minus 1. 
Many machines may have 64 elements over here. So vector mask, what is vector mask? Uh, essentially, vector mask enables conditional operations. This is branching, but it's really predicated execution. So the idea is you set this vector mask to tell the processor, to, to tell the vector processor which elements of a vector should you really operate on. Maybe you don't want to operate on the entire million elements. Maybe you want to operate conditionally, based on some condition, on some of those elements. Now, how do you determine which of those elements you're going to operate? Well, you set the vector mask register by testing a condition. For example, if, if uh, you do an element-wise comparison to zero of a vector register, if that's true, you set the vector mask for that element to be one. One means you should operate. You should do the next up, upcoming operations on that element. So if you want to conditionally add two vectors, you basically, uh, so if you, let's, say, let's say if you want to conditionally divide. You don't want to divide by zero, right? You want to test uh, if the uh, second vector's uh, elements are all zeros, uh, are zeros or not. You set the vector mask by doing that test, and what you get is essentially a vector register the same length as n, and each bit in that register specifies whether you should do the upcoming operation or not. We will see this uh, in more detail. This way you can conditionally do the vector multiply or vector divide operation. So this is very powerful. This enables predicate execution. This enables branching. Well, this is actually how you get rid of branches. If you have an if and else, you basically set the vector mask according. We'll see examples of this. So what's a vector functional unit? Essentially, it looks like this. You have a vector register, another vector register, and a destination vector register. This, of course, uh, the connections are not uh, as simple as this. But now you can pipeline them. Basically, each vector register feeds one element per cycle into the functional unit. And if you look at this pipeline, uh, when, the vector, uh, when the element zero reaches over here, element one is here, element two is here, element three is here, four, five, six, that way you can pipeline things, right? And these are independent of each other, so there's no need for dependency checking. Now you can have a very fast clock cycle by doing this deep pipeline. Uh, and you can see that element zero is written to the element zero location to vector three and dot, dot, dot in consecutive cycles. Okay, I've already said this. This is a, it's an example six stage multiply. Pipeline vector machines can have deep pipelines in any functional unit, actually. So this is one example vector machine. Uh, you can actually see this. There's one vector machine in ETH. Do you know where it is? In the cab building, floor E. And I'll show you examples of this one, took pictures of it for me yesterday or today. But basically, this is one of the earliest vector machines, K1. Uh, and this is a nice paper that describes it. If you look over here, you see the vector registers. And I think this has uh, eight 64 element vector registers. Vector length, maximum vector length is 64 elements. And you have eight of these registers. You can see the vector functional units. You can see, I believe this is the vector mask register. If I can read this, it's VM. Uh, so vector mask register tells which elements should be operated on. Uh, and you have 64 bits per element. We will see the memory banks very soon and their importance. And you can also see that there are scalar registers because doing scalar operations on vector registers is very inefficient. So if you want to, let's say, uh, do a single addition, and that addition doesn't really, isn't really part of a vector, it's very inefficient to do it on the vector register, so there's take the scalar registers that are also provided over here. And there are address registers to access memory. We're not gonna go into the detail of this. Uh, but we're gonna go into memory banks in a little bit after we take a detour of the uh, vector machine at ETH. Uh, but the, one of the key things that I would like to emphasize here is your speed up is limited by Amdahl's law. You may have a lot of parallelism, and you may, most of your program can be actually parallelized by this vectorization, vector units. But if you don't have enough parallelism, you're limited by the scalar execution unit. So when Cray, Seymour Cray actually designed these processors the first time, he realized that very easily. He said, even though I can make 99% of my program go, let's say, infinitely faster by parallelizing through this vector units, I'm still bound by the scalar part. So this machine was actually not only one of the fastest machines in terms of vector processing of its time, but it was the fastest scalar machine of its time also. Because Seymour Cray was a good architect and he realized that, oh, my speed up is really limited 
by this in the end, so I'm going to put a lot of effort into that as well. Okay, so this is the machine that you have at ETH, actually. Just take a look at it. Uh, it's a Cray uh, XMP28, and you can study it. It's a very similar organization over here. You can download this online, right? You should put it also uh, on the website, but there's a manual over there also you can read. Uh, it's a beautiful machine, as you can see, right? I like the color, too. And there are design details. This actually has two CPUs and the memory. It's, it's, it's relatively old over here. Uh, okay, I'm not going to go through this, as you can see. But these are real machines. Uh, and they're, they're real I.O. and memory subsystems, uh, as you can see. And this is Seymour Cray. Uh, he's actually responsible for a lot of vector machines. And he's also responsible for uh, this uh, nice code. And this actually gives you an idea of that Amdahl's law part of thinking. So if you're pl plowing a field, which one would you rather use? Two strong oxen or 1,024 chickens? So it depends on the field, of course, but... <laughs> so uh, I like thinking about this as this is the vector processing part of it. You have 1,024 chickens, simple uh, units, and this is the scalar part of it, two strong oxen, actually. You need those two strong oxen to actually get the highest performance of the world. So Seymour Cray, we talked about an architect's mind. This, uh, Seymour actually had the architect's mind, and the, the machines he designed were actually beautiful uh, and based on a lot of principles. Okay, so let's get back to these banks over here. Why do we have these banks? So we need to load and store vectors from uh, and to memory. This requires loading and storing multiple elements. So how can we do multiple elements uh, vector load and store? Elements are separated from each other by a constant distance. We're going to assume this. We're going to break this later on. Uh, this is called a stride. We're going to assume stride one for now, which is the really easy case, actually. Elements can be loaded in consecutive cycles if we can start the load of one element per cycle. Right? That's the idea. In a vector processor, you don't need to load all elements at the same time. All elements at the same time actually pushes even more requirements into the memory system. But we want to do one element every cycle. So you need to start the load of one element per cycle. This way you can sustain a throughput of one element per cycle. Right? So the question is, how do we achieve this with a memory that takes more than one cycle to access? If your memory takes one cycle to access, no problem. Every cycle, you get one element. The problem is if your memory takes, I don't know, let's say 11 cycles to access, which was the case in Cray 1. And the answer we've seen actually briefly, you need to bank the memory. Banking means you actually have multiple different banks and your data is in those different banks. Uh, consecutive banks, banks have consecutive elements. Now you can start access to the first bank in the first cycle, the next bank in the next cycle, the next bank in the next cycle, the next bank in the next cycle. And after 11 cycles, the first one is done. After 11 plus one cycle, the second one is done. After 11 plus two cycles, the third one is done, dot, dot, dot. That's the idea, basically, a very simple idea. Uh, now, I must say that you may actually have banks over here, and they may be totally disconnected from each other. That's a, uh, that way you can actually start all, all uh, in this case we have 16 banks, as you can see, right? You can start all 16 loads at the same cycle. You could do that as long as you have multiple data buses, right? Multiple address and data buses to different banks. That's an expensive solution. Remember, that's, that's very expensive. If you want to get 16 elements in the same cycle, you need to have multiple address and data buses connected to these banks. But we want to be a little bit frugal. Uh, we want to start the uh, access of one element per cycle and get the data of one element per cycle. So we can actually have the, single, the same address bus and same data bus going to different banks. We just need different memory data registers and memory address registers for different banks. So the idea is very simple. You divide the memory into banks that can be accessed independently, and banks share the address and data buses to minimize the pin cost. Remember, this is memory. This is off-chip. So these are pins going off, off the chip. This is the CPU. Now you can start and complete one bank access per cycle. Even though this bank access is started at cycle zero, it takes 11 cycles. You can start the second bank access at cycle one. It takes 11 cycles. At the end of cycle 11, you get the data for the first element. At the end of the 12th cycle, you get the data of the second element. At the end of the 13th cycle, you get the data of the third element. So you get the idea. This way, you can sustain n parallel accesses if all of the n go to different banks. Now, the beauty of this is if your stride is one, and if your consecutive elements, element zero is here, element one is here, element two is here, dot, 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 if they're mapped into consecutive banks, you are able to do this. 
Now the question you should think about is, what if your stride was not one? What if your stride was 16? Now your consecutive elements, in this case, if you don't do something smart about mapping, you're always accessing bank zero. Because element zero is in bank zero, element 16 is in bank zero, element 32 is in bank zero, bank zero dot, 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 right? Not good. So that's exactly what uh, uh, Josh Fisher meant. You need a programmer that's really smart. Because if your elements are always coming from the same bank, tough luck. But if you lay out your data such that elements are in different banks, now you can exploit the parallels. That's exactly the problem when, with programming a GPU today. A GPU programmer really needs to be cognizant of the layout of the data such that you can actually get elements from different banks or channels. Let me finish the memory system and we're going to take a break. Uh, so this is the vector memory system. This is another beautiful picture. So these are the vector registers where memory banks may be connected to. Uh, let's take a look at how we compute the address. As I showed you earlier in this picture, it's very simple. Uh, next address is the previous address plus the stride. So you basically first supply the base address. Uh, and in the first cycle, you generate base plus stride and supply it to uh, the memory system. In the next cycle, you generate uh, the next address. You take the next address plus the stride. In the next cycle, you take the next address plus the stride, next address plus the stride. That's how you can generate the addresses in consecutive cycles. It's very simple because you know the stride. Now, this is the condition under which you can sustain one element per cycle throughput. If the stride is equal to one, and consecutive elements are interleaved across the banks, and the number of banks is greater than, the, greater than or equal to the bank latency. So we didn't discuss this before, but this is really important. So if, the, if your bank access latency is 11 cycles, which was the case in Cray 1, you need at least 16 banks. Well, you need at least 11 banks, actually. But 11 is not a nice number to stripe your accesses with if you're doing a binary numbering system, right? That's why you need 16 banks. This way, you can sustain one element per cycle throughput. Because if you had eight banks, you could only start eight accesses, and you'll need to wait three more cycles to, for the first access to finish, because the memory is taking 11 cycles. Okay, that's why, uh, that's why Cray 1 actually had 16 memory banks, because its memory access latency was 11 cycles, and they wanted to sustain one element per cycle throughput to get each element, uh, every, uh, to get consecutive elements per cycle. Okay, so this is a good place to take uh, a 10 minute break, and then we're going to go through this beautiful code example, and we're going to see how much we can speed up this scalar code over here. Okay, I'll see you after 10 minutes. Okay. So before we go into the code example, let me tell you a little bit more about the banks, because I think this is a really important concept. We will see this more. Uh, I'll switch to DocuCam for this. Uh, so essentially, the idea is this, right? Remember, we saw memory before. This is memory. And let's, let's assume that this is a monolithic array. Monolithic means you have 0 through n minus 1. Um, I don't know, let's say this is 2 to the uh, 32 minus 1. Basically, this, this memory has 2 to the 32 uh, elements, or let's say bytes. This is byte 0, byte 1, dot, 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 uh, 2 to the 32 minus 1. Now, this memory, if you have a single memory address register and memory data register, essentially you have a single port to this memory, you can supply only one address uh, and wait for let's say M cycles, and the data comes back from memory after M cycles. This is a memory that's single ported, single port, no banking. In other words, I don't know why this is. Okay, no banking. In other words, it's a monolithic array. This array is monolithic. So you can only start one access per cycle, and you have to wait m cycles to be able to start the next access. This is terrible for a vector processor, right? You don't want to wait m cycles to get the next element from memory. So that's why we turn this into whatever that was in that picture. Let's assume that we divide this into 16 banks. 16 banks is essentially dividing the address space in by 16. This is 0 as opposed to 232 minus 1. This is what you get. Oh, 
probably I should do this, right? Minus one, <laughs> something like that. Okay, so basically you divide it uh, by 16. Let's, let's assume that, um, you know, let's, let's use simple numbers over here. Let's, let's say that your n is, I don't know, uh, 1024, right? It's a small memory, that's okay. This is basically 1024 divided by 16, which is two to the 10 divided by two to the four, which is two to the six, right? That's 64. The first 64 elements are here. The next 64 elements, uh, 63, 64 through 127 is here. 65 through, uh, I don't know, no, 128 through whatever is here, dot, 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 right? Now you have 16 banks. Bank zero, bank one, bank two, bank 15 over here. And we have a single data bus, single address bus, that's feeding a memory address register over here and a memory data register over here. So each bank has a memory address register and a memory data register, if you remember that picture. So single address bus is feeding and a single data bus is feeding over here. Now you can start consecutive accesses in consecutive cycles. Assume that you want to access address zero over here, you access this bank. Assume that you want to access address one over here, well, it goes to this bank. That's not good. So you should have laid out your data nicely. That's what I exactly mean by layout of the data. So you need to actually ensure that address zero is here, address one is here, address two is here, address 15 is here. Now address 16 is here, 17 is here, 18 is here, uh, 31 is here, and 32 is here. Now that's how you lay out your data. If your stride is one and consecutive elements are in consecutive banks, in the first cycle, you can start access to address zero. In the next cycle, you can start access to address one, which goes to this bank. In the next cycle, you can start access to address two, dot, dot, dot. And you can start accesses to, uh, in, at the, I guess at the 11th cycle, you can start access to address 10, right? And if you take 11 cycles to get the data, in this cycle, let's see, at cycle 11, you get the data back. Data for address zero comes back, right? And in the next cycle, you get the data for address one. So it's a mess over here, sorry about that. I should have used the board. But basically, you start accesses, this is cycle zero, one, two, dot, 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 in consecutive cycles, and you start getting the data back after zero plus bank access latency. And bank access latency was 11 cycles as we've discussed for K1, right? This way, you can get one element per cycle after 11 cycles. Initially, you fill the pipeline, if you will. You start consecutive accesses, but now you start getting one element per cycle. Now in this cycle, you start access to uh, address 11, which is in the 11th bank. Next cycle, address 12, address 13, dot, dot, dot. So you could keep doing this every cycle because the access latency of a bank is smaller than or equal to the number of banks you have over here and you're accessing consecutive elements. Does that make sense? So that's the idea. I wanted to go into a little bit more detail of this because it's going to be important. Now, if your data is not mapped this way, 0, 1, 2, 15, or let's assume that the data is mapped this way, but if your stride was 16, now you have a problem, right? If your stride is 16 over here, what you really need to access is address zero in the first cycle, address 16 in the next cycle. Well, you can start address zero access in the first cycle. This bank will be busy for the next 11 cycles, but you cannot start address 16 because this bank is busy servicing this, right? So you'll have to wait for 11 cycles. If, uh, so you start the access to address 16 after 11 cycles, but you cannot start address 32 because bank zero is still busy. So everything is mapped to bank zero. As a result, you cannot load multiple elements uh, at the same time. You have to really, you're really bound by the memory latency. And that's the problem with not so good data mapping or not a good stride. Right? That's why the memory layout is really important and or your stride is really important. So how do you fix this problem? Either you change your access pattern in your program such that you do zero, one, two, three, or you change the data layout such that consecutive elements are not like this, but address zero is here and address 16 is here in the next bank, address 32 is in the next bank, dot, dot, dot. 
Now you have a problem, right? Or you have some other mechanism that kind of enables you to access different addresses in different cycles, right? Or the, the addresses that you need in consecutive cycles. So that's the difficulty in data mapping. But all of this is enabled by really banking, as you can see, right? The benefit of banking is, as opposed to having a single port, a single, uh, as opposed to be, uh, as opposed to having uh, a memory that can enable you to start one access per cycle, now you can start, uh, so one access every n cycles, every m cycles, now you can start one access per cycle, right? That's the idea. Now there's another benefit, which we didn't talk about really, which is, this memory is huge. So you need a huge address decoder to access this. Whereas if you look at each bank, the address decoder is much smaller, right? In fact, if you have 16 banks, it's almost like 16, uh, the 16th, uh, 1 16th the size of this address decoder. So the latency of this, each bank actually can be smaller than the latency of a monolithic memory. Because you're, you've divided it up into smaller pieces and you're much less bound by this address decoder latency as well as the bit line latency over here, which we are not going to go into. But your wires, your, your logic is much simpler for a bank and your wires are much shorter for a bank. As a result, the access latency of each bank is also smaller. So you, you kill two birds with one stone by banking the memory or partitioning it. One, you enable uh, the starting of consecutive access in consecutive cycles. Second, you reduce the latency of each access. So this, the latency here is M. I can guarantee you that the latency over here will be less than M cycles. Of course, it depends on how many banks you have and how you actually design your memory. So that's the idea of banking. And it's really important whenever you want to be able to start multiple accesses, uh, either per cycle or every consecutive cycle. In this case, we saw uh, the example of consecutive cycles over here. And this didn't start. OK, is that clear? OK, now let's go through this example over here. This is uh, an important example. And we'll see how a vector processor speeds up this code. And this is the same example that I showed you. It's an element-wise average of two vectors. Each have 50 elements. And this is the scalar code I wrote for you with some ISA. In fact, I tried to minimize the instructions, as you can see. So basically, you set up uh, the vector length in this case, but it's not a vector. So it's really the iteration count. And you move the addresses of the beginning of the arrays over here into registers. Let's assume each of them takes one cycle. And this is a load instruction. Basically, it's a single load. It's basically loading, uh, the, uh, loading the data at memory address specified by R1. It takes 11 cycles into a single scalar register. This is scalar code. And I, I, I assume that there's the, this operation also does auto increment so that I can fit this code over here. But basically, the idea over here is when you load the address, you also automatically increment R1. So this operation specifies two things. Load what's in R, uh, take the address, uh, take, take the data value in R1, treat it as an address, go to memory, get the data in that location, put it into R4, and at the same time, increment R1. Because we're going to actually go to the next uh, address uh, or next index, uh, yeah, the next consecutive address in the next iteration of the loop. So this auto increment addressing actually was developed so that you can actually do this addressing uh, much more simple uh, by, by getting rid of one in instruction. If you didn't have this sort of addressing, there should be another instruction over here that says R1 equals R1 plus 1. Right. That's the idea of auto increment addressing. So I'm optimizing the single threaded code also, single scalar code. Uh, the next instruction, uh, basically this loads one element of vector A. The next instruction essentially does the same thing for vector B, loads that element. Then you add those elements. Then you divide it by two, which is shifting the result by one. Then the, you store the results into uh, vector, uh, the, the, the corresponding location specified by the address of vector C. So you, this is the code for one element. Then you check whether you're actually done with the iterations. And this is also a special instruction. It basically does decrement and branch if not zero. Basically, it decrements R0, uh, checks if it is zero after the decrement. If not zero, uh, then it goes back to X over here. It's this is essentially implementing this loop, right, in a scalar way. Make sense? 
So element by element. So it's very inefficient. And if you count the number of instructions, this is 304 dynamic instructions. This is 50 of these over here. Uh, and I think 6 times 50 is 300. And you have four of these to set up the loop to begin with. So we're going to reduce this to seven dynamic instructions with vector processing. But let's before, before that, let's take a look at how long it takes to execute this. It's going to be important also. So I'm going to make some assumptions. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. But if you do this code, execute this code on an in-order processor, we're not going to look at out of order here. Uh, out of order, you can do on your own, but there needs to be more assumptions. Basically, with one bank, the first two loads in the loop cannot be pipelined because you have only one bank. Uh, as a result, what you get is 2,004 cycles. Let's take a look at this. Basically, four cycles over here, 11 cycles for this one, 11 cycles for this one, four, fun, 11, 12. These are all dependent on each other, if you can see. R5 uses here, R6 used here, R7 used here. So you pay the full cost of the instructions. As a result, you get 50 cycles, sorry, 40 cycles in one loop iteration, and you do 50 loop iterations, so it's 2,004 cycles. Clearly, you can optimize this, but we're not going to go through this. Now, if, the, if you actually had 16 banks, you could reduce the execution time even on the scalar machine. So you can actually pipeline the operation of these instructions. Uh, what you can do is, uh, in the first cycle, you start uh, the execution of this load. It goes to one bank. In the next cycle, you can also start the execution of this load because it goes to some other bank. Now, you can actually service these loads in parallel in two different banks over here. Right? That's the idea over here. This is in-order scalar processor. We're still issuing instructions in order to the memory system. But you can now pipeline these two loads. This starts in one cycle. This one starts in the next cycle. Which means that together, these two loads take, I guess, 11 plus 1 cycles, right? 12 cycles, 16. Uh, 17, 28, 30. Now the loop is 30 cycles as opposed to 40 cycles because we pipeline these. Make sense? That's the idea. So if you look over here, that's exactly the calculation. The loop takes 30 cycles and you iterate 50 times. So you have 1,504 cycles for this iteration just by banking the memory because we overlap these two load instructions. This one starts at first. This one started in the next iteration. This took 11 cycles, and 10 cycles of them were overlapped. So this one finished in the 12th cycle. That's why you get 12 over here, as opposed to adding 11 plus 11. OK, you should think about this yourself, and you'll convince yourself. It's very simple. But now by banking, we've actually reduced the execution time to 1504, which is nice, right? You actually improved performance by 25% just by having more banks. And you didn't really need 16 banks, actually. You just needed two banks. right? in this case. OK. So in this case, why 16 banks? We're going to take a look at this. We discussed this already, so I'm not going to go over, go over this uh, again. But we're going to go back to that. So this, the realization is that this loop that we looked at, the element-wise averaging, is actually a vectorizable loop. So what does that mean? A, vectorizable, a loop is vectorizable if each iteration is independent of any other. We're going to exploit that. So this loop is vectorizable. There is no dependencies between any iterations of this loop. They're all operating on different data elements, which means that we can completely parallelize the different iterations. So if you vectorize this, this is the code we're going to write for uh, a, a vector machine. And I'm going to show you each instruction and its latency. It's going to be as simple as this. No branches. We're going to first set up the vector length. Vector length is 50. Vector stride is 1. You should lay out your data that way. Otherwise, you should set your vector stride to something else. But in this case, the stride is 1. Now, this is the vectorized part of the loop. These are scalar instructions to set up uh, the vector machine. And you do a vector load starting from memory address A into vector register 0. And this takes 11 cycles to get the first data element. The next cycle, you get the next data element. The next cycle, you get the next data element. The next cycle, you get the next data element. So this instruction finishes 11 cycles plus vector length minus one number of cycles. That's the idea of banking, right? This enabled us to get consecutive data elements in consecutive cycles, but we needed to pay the latency of the first element, of course, right? So let's go back to this over here very quickly. So now we can do a vector load 
uh, in cycle uh, in the first cycle, cycle zero, we can start the load of first element. Eleven cycles, we get the first element from memory. At the twelfth cycle, we get the next element. Thirteenth cycle, we get the next element. Dot dot dot, and essentially, uh, we get uh, fifty elements after eleven plus forty nine cycles. After sixty cycles, at the sixtieth cycle, we get all fifty elements. And they all go into the vector register. Just to visualize this, the first element goes into element zero in the vector register, the next element goes to element one, dot, dot, dot. They all have their place in the vector register. Make sense? Okay, good. So how long did the instruction take? If your vector length is 50, this takes 60 cycles, right? If your vector length is 50, the next one is also very similar, it takes 60 cycles. Now we'll have a problem over here though very soon. Uh, and the next is a vector add. Basically, you take vector zero, add it to vector one. This takes four cycles for the first element uh, to finish. The next element finishes after one more cycle, the next element after one more cycle, ne next element after one more cycle, dot, dot, dot. But each element takes four cycles, but, and you can pipeline them. Essentially, banking enabled us to pipeline the memory. Right? Uh, and uh, you do a vector shift, you basically take the result of this, divide, uh, shift it by one. Let's assume that shift takes one cycle, and you again get the result of the first shift after one cycle, uh, and then you, you get the consecutive results for different elements in the remaining cycles. And this is the vector store. Basically, we shifted the vector, 50 elements uh, result, and now we're going to store it into a memory location, and we need, a, we need to again go to the memory and do the store. Now, as you can see, we have uh, three memory operations. They're going to be our bottlenecks soon. But if you look, the, one of the first observations in this is you have only seven dynamic instructions, right? As opposed to 304. You don't need to decode 304 instructions. You don't need to fetch 304 instructions. You just need to do it for seven. But you still have the same operation level parallelism, right? Well, you have much more operation level parallelism, but you still do the same number of operations, right? That's why this is much more efficient. You got rid of fetching and decoding I guess 297 instructions, right? With seven instructions, you were able to encode a lot of operations. Make sense? So that's where you gain first. Now let's take a look at how much you gain in terms of latency. This, this saves you energy, certainly, but this may also save you energy, uh, latency, but we, we're not going to talk about that. Uh, but uh, you're, we're going to save in terms of latency also. So let's take a look at how, how long it takes to execute uh, this program. I'm going to switch between these two because it may not be easy to put everything in one slide. So we're gonna assume no chaining. We're gonna assume actually something really uh, dumb, if you will. Uh, what does chaining mean? Chaining is essentially vector data forwarding. The output of a vector functional unit cannot be used as the direct input of another. We're gonna relax this later on. Which means that whenever you do a load, 50 element load, you're gonna load all of them into the register first, and you cannot start whatever operation comes after that on any of the element until the full vector is loaded into the vector register. You need the full vector into a vector register to start an operation. No data forwarding. We're going to relax that. The entire vector register needs to be ready before any element of it can be used as part of another operation. We're going to assume one memory address port, uh, basically one address generator. So we're going to assume different banks. That's fine. You can start to access for different banks, but one port per bank, which means that we cannot do two loads in a single bank. We can just do one load access per bank. So if there's another load instruction that actually wants the same bank, tough luck. It'll need to wait until that access finishes. Right. Now you can make the memory more expensive, have two ports, such that you can do two accesses in the same bank. This is different from banking. Now you can actually do two parallel accesses to memory. Okay, but we're gonna be frugal first. One memory port only. And we're gonna assume 16 memory banks, word interleave, consecutive elements are in consecutive, lo consecutive banks. And this is the execution time. Now this may look like magic, but it's actually very simple. What I've essentially do done over here is added the latencies that you've seen uh, before. This is what it takes to execute this program. And I'm going to go back over here to be able to do this. Okay, there's the DocuCam. Yeah, this was our program. And essentially, uh, this is the execution time, so let's take a look at this over here. Uh, 
It takes one cycle to execute the first move y. It takes one cycle to execute the set the straight, straight because the vector length uh, straight. Uh, and the first load over here, it takes 11 cycles to get the first data elements. It takes 49 cycles for the remaining data elements. This is the first load. Now you cannot start the next load. Now, now you, cannot, you can do this because your banks, uh, you have multiple banks, so you can start the a load of consecutive elements for this load, but you cannot start this for this load because this load actually needs the same banks. As a result, you have to wait for this load, you have to wait until the previous load finishes. The second load, this one over here, again does the same thing, 11 cycles for the first element, 49 cycles for the remaining 50 element, uh, 49 elements. Uh, you cannot start uh, this add before any of these are completely ready. That's why this add needs to wait until both of these vector registers are completely full, all of those 50 elements are uh, loaded. You can start that only after that. Now the first add, uh, the, uh, the add of the first elements takes four, four cycles, and the remaining elements take four nine cycles after that. That's fine, it's pipelined. You cannot start the shift, shift is dependent on the add, until the full 50 element register is done with the add. Now you can see that this is very conservative, right? We could have actually started this shift earlier, but we're not because we're assuming no chaining, no vector data forwarding from one function unit to another. We have to wait until the register is ready. And the register is ready at this point, all 50 elements are uh, added. Now you can start the shift. Each shift takes one cycle. So to be able to operate on 49 elements, you, the first element is done after one cycle, the remaining elements are done after the rest of the 49 cycles. And you cannot start the load until the shift is done, because shift, uh, load, uh, sorry, you cannot start the store until the shift is done, because the store is dependent on uh, the shift, and basically you pay the full cost over here, 11 cycles to the first store, 49 cycles for the remaining elements to through the bank. That's our execution timeline. You add up the numbers, you get 285 cycles. Even with these assumptions, we're actually much better, right? Let's go back over here. So we're actually much better, 285 cycles. So if we go back a few slides very quickly, we were at 1504 cycles. That's a lot of improvement, right? So that's good, we're happy. But of course, you're never happy. The question is, can we do better? So one way of doing better is very simple. The idea of data forwarding, we've seen it in pipelines. We're gonna essentially do the same thing in a vector machine. And the idea is very simple. You forward the data from one, well, one vector function unit to another directly, as opposed to waiting for all of the data elements for a vector to be ready in a vector register. Very simple and powerful idea. So basically, you can see chaining means that load unit provides the data not only into the register, but directly into the multiplier. If load is the multiplier is dependent on the load, that's great. You take the first element, you take the first element from here, you can start the multiply directly. When the second element comes back in the next cycle, you take it over here, and the second element multiply can start directly. So you're basically pipelining the operations on a per element basis, right? Uh, or forwarding uh, essentially every element to, uh, to here, as opposed to waiting for all 50 elements to be present here, and then supplying the data directly into the multiplier after all 50 elements are populated after the load. Makes sense, right? Very simple. Now, of course, this comes at a cost. Like any forwarding mechanism, you need to have these forwarding paths. It's called chaining in vector machine literature. That's okay, it's forwarding, essentially. So you do this, for example, from the multiply to the adder also, and you need to have a path from the adder to the multiplier and adder to the loader and dot, 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 right? You, have the, you need to have the full bypass or forwarding network to be able to do this perfectly. Okay, but let's see the performance of our code with chain. So it's going to be, again, our, we'll go back to our code. Oh, okay, you should look over here. So by chaining, if you remember our code over here, this was the first load, this is the second load. We cannot chain these because it's actually, there's no dependence. The, the, the reason this load cannot start is because we don't have multiple ports, that's fine. But now, over here, what we've done is, We've loaded the, the first element of the second load, and we already have the first element of the first load, and we're going to do an addition, right? If we go back over here, 
Yeah, this was our first load. This was our second load. We're going to add the results over here, store them into V2. And then we're going to shift the result over here. Once the first element of both of these are done, we can actually start the add. That's the realization. So we can actually forward the results from this load into this adder. And once the first element of this add is done, we can actually start the shift. Once the first element of the shift is done, we can actually start the store. That's the idea. Don't wait for the entire vector register to be done. Forward the data element by element. So this is where the first, the second load is done. If the first element of the second load is done, you can start the addition of those first elements. And in the next cycle, the, uh, the next element will be done. You can start the addition of those next elements in the next cycle. So basically, we're actually reducing execution time by supplying the data element by element to the adder over here. Now, once the, this is where the first uh, element of the addition is done. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go back, but remember the vAd, vector add over here, and then vector shift. This is where the first element of the vector add is done. You can start the vector shift for that element in, the, in that cycle, in the next cycle after that, that element is done. Make sense? Basically, we chained, or we forwarded the data values instead of waiting for the entire vector register to be done. Instead of waiting until here, we've started the operation here. Now, technically, you should be able to start the store after the shift is done, but we cannot because we're assuming one port to memory. We only have one read or write port to memory, which means that the bank needs to be free so that we can store the slow, uh, start the store instruction. That's why we cannot start, uh, start the store instruction over here. Okay, so this brought us back to, if you do the calculation over here, 182 cycles, better than 285, right? Basically just by chaining, just by doing data forwarding. So it's very powerful. Now, can we do better? Then the question you ask is, these two loads, they're actually completely independent of each other. But we're not doing anything. They're, we cannot pipeline them. Actually, this load and store, they're also completely independent of each other. We're not doing anything to pipeline them. Why? Well, because each, we assume that each memory bank has a single port. Now we're bottlenecked by memory bandwidth. Computation is not a problem. Memory bandwidth is a big problem. So now we're going to solve the memory bandwidth problem by making the memory more expensive. So can we do better? The next idea is we still assume chaining, but now we're going to add more ports to memory. Two load ports and one store port to each bank. Now what does this mean? Each bank becomes more complicated. So this could actually increase the latency, but we're not going to look at the latency uh, of the bank. So basically, as opposed to having one port per bank, we're going to still keep the banking. So this is bank 0, 1, 15. Memory address register, memory data register. Remember, each bank had these. I'm not going to draw them again. And then you get the data. Well, for each bank, we're going to add another address register, another data register to do the load. So you can do two loads per cycle. And then also a memory address register and memory data register for store. So you can actually do one store per cycle. Now, how do you do that? You need to add more ports to memory, and you've seen all of the logic design before. You could actually construct a memory that can do this. But it's expensive because now you have three ports to your memory, two load ports and one store port. But it's going to buy us benefit. And the benefits you'll, you'll be able to quantify. Essentially, this is the benefit we get. Now, because these two loads are completely independent of each other and there are two ports in a bank, instead of waiting 60 cycles to start the first element load of the second load instruction, we just wait one cycle. The first cycle, we send this load. The next cycle, we send this load. They're using different address generators, address generation uh, uh, logic. And as a result, they can actually be completely pipelined. When this load is ac accessing one port, this load is accessing the next port, uh, the, the, the other port, because we have two load ports. And this is still the same. This is the add. This is the shift. And we can also start the store instruction right after the shift. 
because we have a separate store port, right? And these have no dependencies with each other, as you can see. Make sense? So that's the idea. We parallelize the memory operations. As a result, we reduce things to 79 cycles. We started with 1504, so that's a 19x performance improvement. That's good, right? <laughs> of course, we made the machine a little bit more expensive, <laughs> clearly more expensive, but 19x is also good. And this is essentially what uh, vector processors do, what GPUs also do. They use all of these principles. Okay, can you do better? I'm gonna leave that up to you. <laughs> clearly you can. So let's answer some questions. Let's, now that we've seen that you can improve performance significantly, can we make this more general? One question uh, you should probably have by now is what if the number of data elements is greater than the data number of elements in a vector register? You need to handle this because you don't always have only 64 elements. You're, you're always, uh, your, your vectors are, it depends on the program, right? Sometimes you're operating on three element vectors, sometimes you're operating on a billion element vectors. But if your, your hardware provides a maximum vector length of 64, you need to be able to handle that. How do you handle that? Basically, you need to break the loop such that each iteration operates on the number of elements in a vector register. That's the idea over here. So, 500, if, for example, if you have 512, uh, 27 data elements and 64 element vector registers, essentially you have eight iterations where vector length is 64. So now we have a loop. You need to have loops because of this reason. You cannot eliminate all the branches. Uh, and you have one iteration where the vector length is 15. Now this is nice because, uh, so if you want to do that iteration, you need to change the value of vector length. If you change the value of vector length, that affects the pipeline quite a bit because pipeline relies on your vector length to stay constant, right? If you change it between instructions, now what happens to the previous instruction and the next instruction? You have that problem. You should think about this a little bit. So the nice thing, this is, this is nice because vector length doesn't change, so you can actually fill the pipeline nicely, but when you change the vector length, your pipeline will, will need to have a bubble. This is called vector strip mining. It's called strip mining because of this, actually. It's actually an interesting name. Basically, when you, uh, when you do mining, uh, you have stuff that's, uh, that covers the deposit. You're really looking for gold, you're mining for gold, but you have this ugly stuff that's dirt. You have to take that out of the way to get to the gold. And if you go back, this is dirt. <laughs> Those 15 elements are dirt. <laughs> the remaining is the gold because you don't change the 64 uh, element uh, vector register over here. You, so you get to the gold, you, got, you, got, you, get, you have to get rid of the dirt first. That's a beautiful analogy. <laughs> and I didn't make it up. <laughs> this is actually vector processing literature. <laughs> Okay, so there's another question, which is actually, now we're going to make it even more powerful. And the question is, what if your vector data is not stored in a strided fashion in memory? What if you have irregular memory access to a vector? Now our idea would be in direction to combine or pack elements into vector registers. We're not going to have a nice stride. We're going to have another register that tells us, oh, these are the locations, offsets from the base address that I should really get to operate on stuff. This, these are called scatter-gather operations. These are also present in all modern SIMD engines right now. And the idea is very simple. So for example, you have something like this. You have, you have a loop with this sort of indirect access. How do you do this vectorization? If you relied on a stride, this doesn't work because this is irregular, right? This D array can provide some, any offset. This I is regular, it's striding with a stride of one, but this you have no idea. So the idea is to have an index load instruction. It's also called a gather instruction. Basically, that's this one. You load indirect from the C base, uh, base of the C array, and you load that into a vector C. Now you can load the vector B easily, as you can see over here. But first you need to load the indices in some other vector D. So let me give you an example of this. You load the indices into a vector, and then you're going to have a load indirect instruction that takes the base address and in consecutive cycles goes through every index in this vector D and adds the base to the index, base index, base index, base index, base index, and that's how it calculates the address. Okay, let's, uh, let's take a look at this. So this is the index vector. Let's say it's a four elements vector. And this is the data vector. Let's say we're doing a, a store operation over here. Uh, 
if you're, you supply a base address, the address you compute uh, for the data to store or load, it doesn't matter here, but uh, what happens is if this is your index vector, this is your data vector, what gets stored in memory with a store operation is you take the base address in the first cycle, add the index vector, base plus zero gets 3.14. Next cycle, again, we have a vector, right? Base plus two gets 6.5 because you take the address from the, you take the index from the index vector, add it to the base address. You take the data from the data vector, you store it at that address. So base plus two gets 6.5. Next cycle, base plus six is our address. It gets 71.2. Next cycle, base plus seven gets 2.71. That's the idea. Now we, we didn't do anything to base plus one, base plus three, base plus four, base plus five. We operate on only data stored in these addresses. And the way we enabled that was by going through this index vector that specified where exactly those addresses, those locations were. These are the offsets from the base. Does that make sense? Essentially, you've enabled operation on, like, let me call this sparse matrix or sparse vectors. It's some elements you don't really care about, some elements you care about. You only operate on those elements you really care about. So loads and stores use an index vector which is added to the base register to generate the addresses. That's the idea. It's very simple. It's an indexed load instruction. So you can take a look at it. Uh, any questions? You could do the load also, right? If, you, if this was the data that was stored in your memory, you could provide an index vector and you could do the load that way. Right? Store is just the dual of the load that's just storing. But for the load, let's say, let's say you want to load elements zero and two only. You set your vector length to two, you set your base address to something, and then you do a vector load through this index vector. You need to construct that index vector also. And you get element zero in the first cycle, element two in the next cycle and you only access these two places. Right. So if your vector was very sparse, let's say most of it is zeros, and you have, let's say, five or six elements uh, that are not zeros, and you don't want to operate on zeros, you construct an index vector that points to the offsets of those elements that are not zeros, and then you do an indexed vector load, which is essentially a gather operation. You just load those elements into your vector register. You operate only on those elements, and then you store the data in a scattered fashion. You do an index store instruction using the same index vector. Now I can only modify those elements. Right? So basically gather the data, pack it into a vector register, even though they're not consecutive in memory. You operate on that packed vector register, even though the data elements were not consecutive in memory. And when you're done with your operations, you store them back into the same place in memory by doing a scatter, which is really an indexed store using the same indices that distributes the data to the locations where they're supposed to be in. Now this is very powerful. Now you can access arbitrary locations in memory. They don't have to be following a stride. There should not be, uh, basically there, there's no reason in this case for uh, the different uh, data elements to have, uh, to, have a, to have the same stride, right? To, to be separated by the same uh, uh, number of locations in memory. Now, of course, there's a cost to it, which, you, which is you need to go through the index vector. Now, what happens to your memory system? Your memory system was designed to support some stride nicely, but there is no stride here. Maybe this is nice, right? Zero, two, six, seven. Okay, that's maybe still nice. But what if your index vector was such that they all map to the same bank? Well, tough luck. So these index vector loads and stores put more strain on the memory system because this index can be anything, right? There is no stride, there's no predictability, almost, uh, unless these addresses are striding, but then there, uh, you should probably know that beforehand. Okay, so that's the idea. Now it's very powerful, right? We want to do more. <laughs> so conditional operations. What if some operations should not be executed on a vector based on some dynamically determined condition? Right? So this is an example over here. Basically, uh, if AI is not equal to zero, uh, only then we want to set uh, the BI, otherwise we don't want to change uh, that element in our AB. How do we do this? Well, I remember the masked operations. I discussed this. Vector mask registers a bit mask, determining which data elements should not be operated on or acted upon. Uh, 
And this is the code for this. Basically, we load A, we load B, and we check whether A's elements are not equal to zero and set the bits accordingly. If the element is not equal to zero, that, bits, that corresponding bit in the mask register is set to one, otherwise it's set to zero. And all of the remaining operations are now conditional upon that mask. Meaning, if you do this multiply, vector zero, vector one, it's element by element, right? But which element you do, you really actually do this multiply on is governed by vector mask. If the vector mask has element zero, has a vector mask bit set to one, that multiply will take effect. If it's set to zero, that multiply will not take effect on that element. Basically, vector mask is a element by element bit mask that tells you which element should this operation take effect on. That's true for the vector store also. So this vector multiply operates only on those elements where the vector mask is set to be one. That's the idea. Which is now, now you have a conditional multiply operation, right? This essentially predicated execution. We've converted the control flow dependency over here into a data flow dependency, and the data flow, this is actually a predicate register if you think about it. It's called a mask register, but it's really the predicate register as before. If the predicate is true, the multiply takes effect and the store takes effect. If the predicate is false, essentially that multiply is a no-op for that element. And that store is also a no-op. Okay, let's take a look at another example of masking. This is if and else, as you can see. If, a is greater, if AI is greater than BI, then you set CI to be AI, otherwise you set CI to be BI. So how do you do this? You compare A and B to get the V mask, and you do a mass store of A into C, because if, if the condition holds, only those elements will be stored. Now the remaining elements, you should do the store uh, for, from the B into C, so you complement the V mask, so your vector mask is complemented, and you do a mask store of B into the C. Make sense? Normally, if you're unconditional, your vector mask is all ones. All of the vector elements should be operated on, but by changing the vector mask, you do conditional operations on different elements of a vector. It's very powerful. And the idea is very simple. So for example, if your, vector if your A and B values are like this, this is the A array, this is the B array, uh, now, if AI greater than or equal to BI is not true over here, so a vector mask register is set to zero here, only for these elements, vector mask register is set to zero. For everything else, vector mask register is set to one. So when you actually do the store of A into C, uh, only these ones will be stored. So the, uh, C array gets two, three, uh, and zero, six, minus seven in corresponding positions, and C array doesn't get disturbed when you actually have vector mask is zero for those elements. And you need to complement the V mask. So this becomes one, this becomes one, this becomes one after this. And then you do the store of B for those elements. So you should go through this example. I went through this relatively fast, but it's a very simple example of predicate execution. So how do you implement this? So this is an example. You'll understand this a little bit better when you've got this. So a simple implementation is you actually execute all N operations and turn off the result right back according to the mask. So in this case, for example, your vector length is 64. You execute all 64, but your vector mask says, oh, these are the mask registers associated with each operation, each element. For the, for the ones where the vector mask is zero, you don't write into the register file. That's the idea. Only for those where the mask register is one, you write into the register file. That essentially enables your mask operations or memory, right? These mask bits govern whether you actually write into a destination register or destination memory location. That's one implementation. Let me finish this implementation and we'll be done. The other implementation can be more smart. Smart meaning you scan this and only execute those operations where the mask bit is one. And if you have an intelligent hardware that can easily do this, it basically says, I'm going to only send to the ALU or, in this, or where, whatever functional unit those elements that I know are going to be one. This, this way I can save energy, for example, right? I don't need to execute everything and then say, oh, I'm not gonna write into the register file, this is inefficient. This way I can save a lot of energy by adding a little bit more hardware to figure out which, which instruction, which, which element should I really operate on or not. And I've given you some of the trade-offs. So this is where we're going to pick up next week. Uh, and we're gonna cover the GPUs as well. Okay, have a good weekend.